there, Corey. <laughs> but he's yeah. got the right idea. Florida, Florida State later this afternoon in the state of Florida. With Jim Barber, Corey Chavis. Let's take a look at the keys to the game, and a lot of this has to do in the trenches, does it not? Yeah, I really think it does, Jim. And I think when you talk about what they're going to do, Coastal Carolina, they're going to have some movement, but they've got to stay square to the ball and not get washed. And then defensively, when you really look at Bethune Cookman, I think Coastal Carolina has some impressive receivers in terms of size. Can they match up? Jazz Moss, Courtney Keith, RD. And this kickoff return starts at about the 10 by Keith. First to speed 30 and track down to the 33 and good field position for the Wildcats to go to work. Return of 23 yards. Quentin Williams is the starting quarterback, but he won't be the only quarterback we see today. He's number 14. Very good with ball security at 62% completions, 10 touchdowns and just two picks. Bethune Cookman can spread you out, but principally the Wildcats want to run the football and drain the clock. Coastal Carolina sets up in a 4-2, but today, because of the fact that the Wildcats can run, you may see a third linebacker in there to try to defend. On first and 10. Quarterback keep and a couple of yards for Quentin Williams. Isidore Jackson, all eyes on him today. He's approaching 1,000 yards. Second in the MEAC, good breakaway speed, and he likes to get to the edge. He does, he runs with ferocity, and that's one of the things we're going to look for is can they tackle him this afternoon. On second and eight, Williams and a strike to the sticks. On the defensive side of the ball today, number 30, Quinn Backus, is a joy to watch. He is a tackling machine. Yeah, he really is. And the one thing about him, he's not a big guy. 5'10", 205 pounds. The reason he's the Big South Defensive Player of the Year, he believes what he sees in attacks. Moments ago, Eddie Poole, his 29th catch of the year, good enough for nine yards and a first down. And the Wildcats control the football at their own 44. Typically Williams from the shotgun. Coastal Carolina showing blitz. Instead of several run play for the quarterback who coming into today's game and gained over 450 yards. Broderick Waters backs him up and either quarterback could start for this team. And they've got a third guy, Jackie Wilson, who actually played in the playoffs a couple of years ago. Williams just about to carry the football for the 100th time. Yeah, and I think when you look at what you just talked about, Jay, is that Jackie Wilson was the guy that was playing all the way back to the, the Alabama State game. So the, the, the plethora of quarterbacks that they can throw at you is a testament to how well Williams has done in terms of taking over the mantra at that position. Bethune Cookman using clock here in the first half and the football right now up to the 50. stop for the moment and we'll resume here shortly actually it's a play clock issue right now 40 seconds game clock will start on the ready Michael Roche is our referee today and we'll introduce the rest of his crew as well as replay officials who may be needed from time to time We go on second and six, and Williams with the happy feet throw across the middle, incomplete and broken up at the 40. That was a good break by Tyler McCarthy. One five foot nine, 180 pounds, but what he does is he reads the eyes of the quarterback and gets uh, good contact on the receiver right there coming across the middle and, and forces to dislodge the ball. Kind of reminds me of the way you used to play with the Commodores. <laughs> fourth all-time in interceptions with Vanderbilt? Yeah, fourth, but I've had some guys about to pass me. They've been, they've been balling a lot more than I was down there. Yeah, pretty good season. Coming off a huge win over Tennessee last week. First significant play of this early quarter. Coastal Carolina coming with a blitz. It gets picked up. Williams throws. Got a receiver at the 40-yard line. Good enough first down for Bethune-Cookman. Pretty 
pretty good protection right there. You see Terrence Hackney on that left side. And I like the way he stood in the pocket, stood firm, and made a decisive throw. Checkley with a reception, and the Wildcats on the move. Cook, the 22nd in the country, little option play right here. Isidore Jackson, they swing it out, and he goes nowhere. Did a nice job of forcing him to run the short side of the field, and Jackson, not particularly big, didn't have a whole lot of room to, to motor over there as he was met by Ladarius Hawthorne, his 55th tackle of the season. Pretty physical player. I think the one thing that you'll see about him, both of these guys will tackle for coastal outside. Loss of a yard on the play, it is second and 11. All the signals come in from eye level for quarterback Williams. They have used two and a half minutes of this opening drive and have moved into shot to clear territory. Williams down the field, has got a receiver incomplete. Overthrew KJ Stroud at the 10 yard line who had a step on the defender. Well, I like the play design right there. They were trying to go for the home run, and, and what they ended up doing, they're running a wheel route with Stroud, and they tried to isolate him at time with Johnny Houston, who's required as a safety to run through as a curl flat player. So it was a good job, I believe, by the, the coaching staff of getting him in an isolation situation. But Williams couldn't hit him in target. Yeah, I'm assuming that play, while it wasn't successful, it's uh, still in the, in the playbook. Yeah, we may see it again a little bit later on. Yes, sir. It's third and predictable, third and 11 for Quentin Williams. Williams throwing across the middle, incomplete. And a one hopped it to his receiver, Checkley, who hit moments ago. And that brings up fourth down. Yeah, I think that drive, when you really look at it, I, I think the coaching staff would say it, it was a case of missed opportunity. Had a chance, hit a couple of plays right there. Checkley was open on the four seams. They basically were running four verticals, and he did a good job of bending. But again, I think Williams' accuracy has been off a little bit early. Corey Kowalski, who averages 36 yards a punt and has knocked the football inside the 20 14 times this year, will shoot for one again. There is a flag on the play as the official catch is made at the 13 yard line, but we'll see what the flag is about. As we have played less than three minutes, Sam Bethune Cookman handing over the football as Michael Roach is set to tell us all about it. Rick Garger is the umpire today. Ray Renard, the linesman. Line judge is Patrick Holt. Back judge, Robert Bittner. The field judge, Hugh Bentley. Side judge, Kyle Burnell. Josh Fritzkell is our replay technician. And Buddy Lewis, our replay official. Holding number four on the return team. The 10 yard penalty. First down. Now the original signal was toward Bethune Cookman, but that's been reversed. And so Coastal Carolina gets the football and gets it very deep in its own territory. Located in Conway, South Carolina, and founded back in 1954, Coastal Carolina has an enrollment over three, 8,000 people, and Kurt Manwaring and Tyler Thickman are some of the famous alumni that have walked the campus. What a beautiful campus it is. Yeah, I think there's some guys. Mike Tolbert would be a little bit upset. His name's not on there. Yeah, we'll, we'll try to put it in later. <laughs> <laughs> Shot to Claire is on offense for the first time, and Aramis Hillary is the quarterback. From their own six, Hillary nearly picked off, and that would have been an easy pick six for Bethune Cookman. Almost too easy. D.J. Howard, whose dad played for Bethune Cookman years back, had a chance to take one away from Hillary, who's been very good with the football this year. 17 touchdowns and just five interceptions. On second down to the ground. Shot to clear his average 200 yards per game rushing the football. And Jeremy Height, one of our impact players, 5'10, 200 pounds. 
career best at 754 yards and 10 touchdowns this season. What do you like about him, by the way? I just like his electricity. He's one of those guys that can really make defenders miss in tight quarters. And today, we'll get a chance to see that because they run him a lot inside. This is a third and seven for Hillary to the flat. Ball caught. Inability to make the man miss, and that means football coming back the way of Bethune Cookman. That's Deion Hanks, the junior out of Miami, up to make the stop in space. And Jarkevious Fields will call his name a lot this year. He is the number one tackler on this team with 88 stops. And he's one of those players that has that inside out range. You saw a good job by Hanks right there. He's the leader, though, Fields. He's one of those players you'll see, like we talked about in the open, around the football. Austin Kane in his own end zone to try to kick it away. Averages 36 yards per punt. He'd like to get a better one than that here. Here comes pressure. It's a low line drive kick. He'll get a bounce, which will help matters. The great field position for the Wildcats inside Coastal Carolina territory at the 44. Back to business with four minutes gone by in the first quarter, opening round of the playoffs. Angela Mellon, Corey Chavis, Jim Barber, welcome back to ESPN3 coverage of college football. Mary McLeod Bethune, you talked to Brian Jenkins about this great lady who founded this university, a Bethune Cookman, and you could spend an hour with him on it, as we did last night. Location, as you know, Daytona Beach, founded in 1904. Enrollment, a little over 3,500. Little of Math uh, Mathis, two of the most famous alums, but perhaps the most famous of all is Mary J. McLeod Bethune, who as an American educator and civil rights leader and born in South Carolina parents who have been slaves and having to work in the fields herself at age five. Put this school together, Corey, with just five students. Got some help from the community and eventually it has worked its way into one of the more well-renowned and historical universities, black colleges in the country. It's just an incredible story. And I think what, what he exemplifies is the continuation of that growth. Saw Isidore Jackson moments ago at a short carry on first down to three. Quentin Williams fires to the flat incomplete. It sets up a third and long, and that's intended for K.J. Stroud, who's become a favorite receiver so far, the quarterback. A little surprised at what they're doing in terms of coming out early in this football game and, and throwing the ball as, as much as they have. I mean, maybe that was the change, be a little bit of a change up. Uh, but, but so far, the running game has not been emphasized as much as I thought it would early. This is a running attack that scored 27 touchdowns this year and has rushed for 247 yards per game. Williams out to the flat. Good enough first down to the 30. Eddie Poole, his second catch of the game and his 30th of the year. He's a transfer from Rutgers University. And here's another look. Well, that's, it's not a problem when you get the ball to this guy. A couple years back, eight touchdowns, 17 career touchdowns. He's been a factor his entire career here. He's got to beat two on defenders because he stands 6'4 and towers over some of those smaller cornerbacks and safeties he typically sees from time to time. Well, he's seen a couple of them out here today. And I think that may have been, we talked about on the other side, uh, how Bethune Cookman would handle the size of Coastal Carolina. The same thing holds true for Coastal Carolina's corners. Wildcats on the move inside the shot to clear 30-yard line. This time to the other side. Again, intended for Stroud. Dontavious Johnson was defending, and that pass nowhere near the receiver. Not going to make a living throwing over there to Johnson to me. I, and I struggled a little bit, I thought, uh, against Stony Brook and Kevin Norrell, who's one of the best receivers in the Big South. But for the most part, he was competitive even in that game. He's got good footwork, four interceptions on the season, and, and I like his swag, the swagger he plays the game with. It is third and nine, nine and a half minutes for the opening quarter. No score. Williams, here comes pressure. They pick up the blitz. He's got a receiver on the flat. That's Jackson. Dragged down inside the 25 by Johnson. Not enough for the first down. But there was a flag back in the original line of scrimmage. Jackson with the catch. And for Isidore, his 14th reception of the year. Now we'll sort out the penalty. And one of the things about Bethune-Cookman is the Wildcats make a lot of them, 
That's Number 53, the offense. It's a 10 yard penalty. Third down. That's on Rashard Brown, the left guard, and that hurts because that would have been a little closer to a first down. But Brian Jenkins was telling us last night, I don't mind the penalties as long as they're not unsportsmanlike because we play aggressive. Well, I, mean, I guess it goes back to the old, old Oakland Raiders type philosophy that maybe those penalties won't affect you if you keep that aggressiveness. And, and we'll see if that holds true. But in a playoff game, as you alluded to, it can be costly. Yeah, you mentioned intensity. We saw Jenkins in our opening today. All fired up and ready to go. Fourth and 19. They've got to get to the 20. Williams. Pocket collapses. He's down. And a shot to clears. Take over on downs. Past the 40-yard line. Only well, so long that uh, he can survive this, and eventually they find their way to him. Well, I think I think it's a surprising that Terrence Hackney was bull rushed that time by really Marcus Crowder, who normally plays inside. They shifted him out that time. He was in a five technique, and he pretty much just bull rushed him back into the quarterback. And it was good protection at first by Hackney, but he got overpowered late. Yeah, let's correct that. Obviously, that was a third down play, and now the punt gives it to the shot to clears around their own 10-yard line. So now they take over possession with 8.23 to go in the first quarter and no score. Second possession coming up for Coastal Carolina. And Aramis Hillary, All-American candidate, who threw five touchdown passes against Presbyterian earlier in the season. Very good with the football, one of the best in the country at pass efficiency. Once again, deep field position. For the shot, the clears will operate from their own 10. These two teams so capable, Corey, of running the ball. It's been a surprise to watch Bethune Cookman put in the air as much as it has so far. Well, I mean, I think when you look at the efficiency of Williams, he does have 10 touchdowns, only two interceptions coming into the game, and he's been their best passer. So him throwing isn't as much of a surprise as the frequency is of which we've seen it. 34 takeaways for Bethune-Cookman's defense. That's best in the country in both FCS and FBS competition. Hillary to throw underneath. Good enough first down and a ball up to the 25-yard line. You can find those open seams over there. You can throw a lot today. You can be successful at it, I would think. Yeah, and they're going to spread it out. That's what they do. You're going to see them in five wide. Some right here, you see them in a four wide. Predominantly, they like to get him in this formation, and they run the ball. He runs the football as well, so very diversified attack. Hillary has thrown the football for over 2,100 yards this year, and he runs the ball. And the first play from scrimmage on this set of downs as we have played more than the first part of the first quarter and there's been no score. Well, I think both teams are still filling each other out. Now, right now, I believe that at some point, they're going to take a shot down the field. Got a chance here with three wide receivers to the near side. Shotgun inside handoff. Height first down past the 35-yard line. Jeremy Height out of Townsend, Georgia. Reach a thousand yards in this team to get to a second playoff game. Well, right away you see the impact player to me, the center, Pat Williams, doing a great job of a turnout inside turnout block, and, and I think he's their best offensive lineman. That's the reason why they run it so much inside. He is also the only senior in that offensive line. He's an All-American candidate, making his 33rd start today. And that pass going nowhere intended for Marcus Whitener, number 34. Aramis Hillary's a cool cat. And you, you mentioned that cool. He had to be cool because Alex Ross, who came in and replaced him, he did real well. So he, he, it was important for him to come back and play well, and he has in the last couple of weeks. Yes, both of these teams had very effective backup quarterbacks. This time a receiver in the slot and a wide out to the near side. And Hillary steps up and he'll keep the ball. And he is brought down at the 42-yard line at a modest gain there of five. Brings up third down for the shot to clears in a scoreless football game. The 
That would be pretty elusive. That offensive line, even though it lacks experience, has allowed only 16 sacks in 11 games this year. Must get the football to the 47 to get a first down. And Miss Hillary steps up, will run for the first down. He has fleet of foot. He has scored three touchdowns this year with the running game, and he's now over 500 yards rushing the ball for the season. And I think the one thing he has is subtle foot quickness. Right here, he has good pocket feel. You see that pressure coming off that left side by Woodard, and he steps up in the pocket. He was kind of trying to climb there, and then he saw an opening to get the first down. He has, to me, a certain calm to his game that has made him effective this year. Well, actually, they're going to measure the first down because it has not been determined that he had enough. He's awful close. What do you think? Give me a, give me a prediction. Well, I already there. made the call. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope I'm right. We'll find well, I, out anyway. I, I, I'm with you, though. I believe it was the first down. Lucky guess on my part. I don't think that was lucky. That's about a yard and a half. Yeah. <laughs> That's not lucky. It looked yeah. good initially here, but you bring out the change, you get nervous up here. Well, I don't know. That was pretty. <laughs> they probably wasted your time <laughs> bringing those changes. <laughs> they wasted your time bringing the change. Well, there you go. <laughs> Joe Mowgli, a first year as head coach, who laid out a quarter of a century before coming back to the game. And Angela Mellon will update us on his story, which is most unique. Fresh set of downs from almost midfield. Quarterback draw, and there's an opening. Into the secondary goes Hillary. First down and then some as he carries the ball all the way down to the 36. And right here you see again, we talked about the blocking up front. Another hold open that time because when you slide Ken Woodard, the defensive end slash defensive tackle down inside. He's only 265 pounds. So if you get your hands on him like they did on that last play, they can open some things up inside of the running game. Nick Addison is the injured free safety for Bethune Cookman. Anthony Woodard, who was down inside right there, get him blocked up a little bit. He's a good football player, so I'd like to see him and and also Mr. Addison. Pick it up a little bit here because Coastal Carolina's kind of got it going. Addison's replacement, by the way, the free safety is Marquise Drayton. It was 6'1, 205 out of Orlando, Florida, not too far down the road here, about 65 miles. So, first down for Aramis Hillary, who now has three carries for 27 yards. We remain scoreless, but the shot to clears with their best opportunity now in Bethune Cookman territory at the 36. Four-man rush, another inside handoff. You'll see a lot that today, and a sizable gain on first down. Again, a team that averages an even 200 yards per game running the football. Call upon Marcus Whitener to carry here on first down. Yeah, he's a little bit bigger, and you know, 200 pounds, well, roughly around the same way, but he runs a little bit bigger, I think. And you see that on that last carry. Kevin Hart. Who can play backup center or guard? Help spring the block there for a short gain on first down. Four and a half minutes for the first quarter. Out to the edge and a pickup of maybe a couple. Nice short and not a very difficult pass for Hillary. Is able to find Tyrell Blanks out of Fort Myers for his first catch. Right there was. Taunt that came out there, and they do a good job to me on screen passes and broken plays in the flats of getting out on their inside out angles. You've seen it a couple of times already. I don't think that's a way to attack this Bethune Cookman defense. This is a four receiver set on uh, third down, trips to the near side. Wildcats showing blitz. They come with five. Hillary fires, not enough for the first down. Defended well by Deion Hanks, the left corner. And that brings up fourth down. It's still a makeable fourth down for Coastal Carolina of three yards. 
So what would you do here? Would you go for it? What would be your call if you were the coach right here? You know, I don't think either team is really comfortable with this kicking game, so this seems to be the most appropriate call. Just four of 11 in field goal attempts. Everybody up on the line of scrimmage. Here comes the blitz. And the throw down the field. It is incomplete and out of bounds. And so on fourth and three, Aramis Hillary goes for it all and unable to convert. Intended for Tyler Blanks. And Blanks are all we have so far in the first quarter. 2.52 left, nothing and nothing. Wildcats free safety Nick Addison have been shaking up moments ago, got back in the game. Corian has made the biggest defensive play of the game just moments ago on Tyrell Blanks. He really did. And he, you see the ball skills he has, finishing the play with the rake down over that right hand. And Blanks almost has the touchdown. And you talked about the score. There's still Blanks up there. Well, he had his six shooter out right there to get that ball out. Yeah, Pretty good did. job by him. Angela Mallon, Corey Chavis, and Jim Barber in a nothing nothing game as the Big South takes on the MEAC. And the MEAC looking for its first playoff win since the last century, which sounds a long time ago, but it was actually 1999. Third offensive series for the Wildcats, and this time nowhere near as good field position as the Cats have had in their earlier possessions. Ball at the 29. Quentin Williams, a well little option. And running to the short side of the field is Rodney Scott, a transfer out of Ole Miss. And once again, his back is he's tracking the play now. We talked about him earlier. He, 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 when, he, when he sees something, he reacts and goes and gets it. In the early part of this game, the Wildcats are throwing the ball a great deal. Now that play selection is evened out. 15. Plays and seven of those running the ball. Little freeze option here for Williams. Shoots one down the field intended for Eddie Poole. And Dontavius Johnson will had him step for step. These two teams are not afraid to go over the top. Not at all. I and mean, right there, what they were trying to do is run a switch route concept. So the inside player went towards the flag and then he went towards the post, which can get your coverage players in problems. And that's one of the things that hurt this defense against Stony Brook earlier this year. Let's see what offensive corner Jim Pry dials up on third down. On third down, the Wildcats are two for four, and that's about their average. They are best in the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference at 47%. Here comes pressure. On the draw, it's going to be a first down. Good play call, Rodney Scott. And the offense picked up the pressure from Coastal Carolina, and Scott gets the first down. Well, I think right here you got to take a look at Eugene Solomon right there leading down. He doesn't even get a block right there. There was a missed tackle in there. Good job by Scott running through uh, with the base in his lower body. Solomon's the little guy on that front line. He is a mere 270 pounds. In fact, you've got an offensive line of 305, 310, 305, and 380. It's kind of wild just to see you know, that, that diversity in terms of the size. Most of those guys being over 300, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Medgar Harrison, their strength and conditioning coach, impressed with what some of those guys have done in terms of work in the weight room. McCoy is the biggest kid on that team at 380. He benches well over 500. You just saw him in your picture, number 75. Another option play, Williams keeps the football. He is beyond the 45-yard line before he gets dragged down by a fired up number 69, Roderick Holder, who is a freshman. And you know what, the one thing you liked about him, what he did right there after the play, showing some energy. They're going to need that because Bethune Cookman can score in bunches. Buck 30 for the first quarter, no score. Williams again to get the play from the sidelines. Need five yards to keep the drive going just shortly past midfield. 
They release, and Williams looks and fires down the field. has got a receiver incomplete. They're not afraid, as we mentioned, to go over the top. And that went there intended for number 17, Gordon. And he's been a big play player, Jim. And I think when you see what he's done, eight catches, 152 yards, and two touchdowns, you keep hearing through the program and he has field speeds. So on game day, he'll do what he just did then. Now, sneaky speed, and he got behind Johnny Houston, who a couple of times now, receivers have gotten behind him in coverage. So that's something that you alluded to earlier that they might come back to maybe a different play with the same guy. Penalty flag on a play by the punt by Kowalski. It is fielded at the 20. 57 seconds for the first quarter. First round of the NCAA FCS championship on ESPN3. It's a motion penalty against the Wildcats. That's our referee today, Michael Roche. Legal motion, number 27 of the kicking team. That five yard penalty will be added to the end of the kick. First down. And when we come back, Shana Claire is back with a football from their own 25 in a scoreless football game. Without a doubt, one of the more entertaining bands in. All of college football, Bethune-Cookman, Jim Barber, Corey Chavis, Angela Mellon, scoreless game here, Wagner leading in first round activity there, 31-14, and they have gone to the fourth quarter. By the way, South Dakota State today, wind chill factor, making the temperature seven degrees. So we drew the right straw in this assignment. <laughs> Aramis Hillary in the third possession of the game for Coastal Carolina has got a receiver at the 40. 18-yard pickup. The game now for Coastal over the eight total yards. And on the receiving end, somebody they've dialed up a couple times in Tyrell Blanks. Yeah, they're seeing something with him, and it's a good job by him high pointing that football. He ran somewhat of a bench out route and, and good accuracy that time by Hillary on the run. 57 total yards today for Bethune Cookman. And no points as we round down the first quarter. Are you surprised? I'm a little bit surprised. I think the, the one thing I was expecting was that you see them both, well, really more Coastal Carolina come out and try to attack down the field. A little more surprised that Bethune Cookman's running game hasn't been established as of yet. So uh, we'll see what happens, but I don't mind defense at all. <laughs> Well, one of the things that Brian Jenkins spoke of last night is staying away from silly penalties, and there's a big one of Bethune-Cookman of 15 yards that'll move the football into Wildcat territory inside the 40. And this is one of the more penalized teams in college football at almost 100 yards a game. And that got him into trouble a couple of weeks back against Morgan State, so. Yes, it did. Empty backfield for the moment. Now Jeremy Hype back to protect his quarterback. And to the edge, a wide open pitch. And good enough for a first down. Now he problems finding Niccolo Mastomario with his 41st catch of the year. And it's interesting. We talked about, you see the wild look right here. They, they're really having some problems with communication. And you've seen it afterwards. Late, you have Howard getting out to make the tackle. But basically, he was uncovered on that bubble screen due to a communication breakdown. After that penalty you mentioned, by the way. Yep. Quarter over, Coastal Carolina with a big penalty by way of the Wildcats is on the move. Can they get to the end zone? Can anybody get to the end zone? That answer on our return. Corey, where else would you rather be than beautiful Daytona Beach, Florida in late November? Tell you what, it's a, a lot warmer here than it is back in Missouri. It's a lot warmer <laughs> here than a lot of places today. Back to the field. Second quarter. Nothing, nothing, but here come the shot to Claire's. 
First set of downs from the Bethune Cookman 28. Set up a bubble screen. Blanks with a catch and a run after the catch to the 20 or maybe inside the 20. Tyrell Blanks is getting a lot of attention from his quarterback so far in this game. And they've done it a lot of ways. You've seen the bubble screens and now you've seen a rocket screen inside. So they're doing it a lot of ways getting him the football. Combined 66 points a game, these two teams average, but nobody's reached the end zone yet. But they're getting awful close. Other shot of clears is Marcus Whitener with his third carry of the game. He had missed six games earlier this year due to injury. Finding some space for him today. Yeah, they are. Third. And that was an outstanding block on the second level. Penalty flag and likely against the offense here on a first and goal from the nine. Before the snap, ball start. Number 34 in the offense. It's a five yard penalty. First down. That's on the running back, Whitener, who hails out of Jonesville, South Carolina. So Moglia's team on the move. Both teams with these high powered offenses, principally run by their rushing games, yet to find the touchdown territory, but it's the best opportunity right now for Coastal Carolina. It is first and goal for the 14. See the Wildcats send uh, an extra linebacker. It's a quarterback keep. It's an option pitch. And it's a touchdown. Marcus Whitener and Costa Carolina strikes first. up right here Jim is that first you're running the zone read so you're responsible for that then he extends it even further and turns it into an option so a, a multi-dimensional zone read slash option it's a multiple play and you have to be very disciplined as a defender now this catcher on for the extra point this year is knocked down 38 of 40 off the hole for the putter Austin Kane from the Big South Conference, Costa Carolina 7, and for the MEAC, nothing. Whitener moments ago to the end zone. Joe Mowgli is the CEO of Coastal Carolina football, and uh, Angela, he's uh, been a CEO in real life too as well. Well, you know, Jim, he talked to us about the difference between the corporate world and the coaching world. He said the product's the same. It's just it's the kids that make the difference. And he said he's living his dream by making the change and coming back to football, being able to change the lives of 18 to 20 year olds. And one of the most impressive things I think he said to us was about the 30 minute talk that's mandatory. You cannot miss it. It's life after football. They talk suicide. They talk terrorism. They talk election. It's the foundation for life after football that Joe Malia says is mandatory every week, Jim. And yes, Angela, he's got a good game plan. He was CEO of TD Ameritrade, Ameritrade for years, still stays on the, serves as chairman of the board. And in fact, USA Today, a recent article with him, not so much on football, but uh, on the world of finances and investments. Although he can talk football as well as anybody. Wildcats bringing it back, past their own 20, no set up shop, just inside the 25 yard line. <laughs> Professional resume of Coach Moglia, Merrill Lynch, started back in 1984, private client group executive committee, then became CEO of TD Ameritrade in 2001. Continued on with that as chairman of the board, where he currently sits. And then he got back to football after about a 25-year absence. And, of course, as cynical as people can be, they were saying, well, why? What's your motive here? And, by the way, how did you get the job? <laughs> but he has proved in his first year that uh, he can transfer, as Angela mentioned, his CEO techniques and strategies to uh, corporate college football, if you will. Yeah, he really has. And I, I think the one thing that you see in this football team, we saw on that, on that last drive, they're a disciplined unit. 
And I think anytime you can incorporate the business world in terms of your team discipline, maybe in those two worlds matching, says a lot about you as a communicator. If you're just joining us, the six play 75 yard drive in a little more than two minutes has been the only scoring of the game for Coastal Carolina as the Wildcats pick up a first down. They're in the ball past the 35 yard line. It's been a steady diet so far of Isidore Jackson. Number two, but Rodney Scott has touched the football as well. Quinn Backus with one of his many tackles today, number 30 is at his linebacker spot. I'm impressed. He's been all over the field and doing it with vigor. On first down, quarterback keep, and Williams gets swallowed up. Glenn Williams is just a sophomore out of Tampa. His backup, Broderick Waters, is a senior. And Jackie Wilson, who had four starts last year for Bethune Cookman, is a junior. So they've got plenty of experience in that quarterback spot. And if needed, they can spell Williams from time to time. Williams runs to the near side. Got nobody to throw the ball to. Did make a man miss. And then rolls out of bounds at the 37. Not much available there for Williams. Yeah, but the linebacker right there, Mike McClure, he'll be beating himself up, or his teammates will, in the film room, because that was one of those stat fillers right there. Had a chance to maybe get him for a sack on the, on the rollout to his blind, his, really his weak arm, his left side. So a little bit surprised they had a roll into his left right there, trying to run some type of smash seven concept, it looked like. By the way, number 10, McClure, at his linebacker spot, actually has a two-point Interception return for score earlier this season. Here comes pressure, and Williams is dragged down. Got swallowed up by Andre Jacobs. And this series of downs over for Bethune Cookman. They must punt. And I'm happy to see that. I, I see this right here. Andre Jacobs, a, a 2010 Big South Defensive Player of the Year. You talked about Joe Mobley and talking about why. I asked him, why is this guy not a starter? He said he's one of our best 11. He's been tremendous this year, an eight-time, I believe, game captain. And the way he closed right there, you can see why he was a significant contributor on this defense for so many years. Big-time play in a big-time game for Jacob. And that's over 200 career tackles. That's most impressive. A short punt. Caught at the 42 in a good spot to start this offense series. For the shot, the Clares are already ahead 7-0. Another look at number 40, Andre Jacobs, his final season as a member of Coastal Carolina. Somewhere in the midst of your picture is number 40, Andre Jacobs, as we went to break, came up with the big sack and of course, you had a pretty good question for, for the coach earlier this week. You know, why is he the backup now when principally he was the guy a couple seasons back? And I, and I have to give Coach credit. He, he says, you, you're going to do it our way. And, and, and I think that he thinks that Jacobs has done a good job. Hillary carrying on first down with the shot to clears ahead in this game. And a touchdown by Marcus Whitener, 7-0. Jim Barber, Corey Chavis, who played a number of years in the National Football League and started Vanderbilt and Angela Mellon patrolling the sidelines. A sun-drenched day in Daytona Beach, Florida, and the temperatures nearly 70 degrees. And to the flat and incomplete. Mastro Mateo was the intended receiver, who, by the way, is a terrific punt returner. We may get a chance to see him excel that today. Right there, I think they did a good job of doing Cookman. You see, he's seven out of 11. He's rushed the ball pretty well. That last play, Tavares Dantzler got inside. He's another guy that Bethune Cookman rotates. One of the reasons they're so effective defensively is that they rotate a number of players, a number of guys get snapped. Bethune Cookman trying to stop the shot of clears on third down. Over the middle, got a receiver, first down and then some. Inside the 40-yard line, the ball is loose. But no fumble, no turnover here. Instead of first down for the Shana Clears inside the 40-yard line. So far, a turnover-free game, and that's 
Niccolo Mastro Mateo on the receiving end is 42nd catch of the year. Very dependable player. You see Addison has been active all day again getting in. We'll play on. The replay is available here in this FCS championship series. And Jeremy Height pushing his way forward and getting point of sport, excuse me, oh, Aramis Hillary carrying the football. And Hillary to the 30-yard line and a pickup of eight. They have them off balance with the two back sets. On film, you see this team a lot with one back sets. Now all of a sudden they're going queens or goal personnel, and they've got both of their backs in the backfield. They're running the zone read and mixing in the option. It's tough to stop. From the shotgun, Amos Hillary, a receiver out to the edge, complete. First down, Jeremy Height, his 25th catch of the season. Right now, the shot of clears are on the move, and Bethune Cookman, Corey, doesn't seem to have an answer. Well, the one thing, again, we see a zone ring fake, this time to White, and all of a sudden, off of that action, you have Height going to the flats. So they're doing a lot with misdirection, and it's very effective. Well, we're in this game now, 9 for 13, as that play stretches out, and there's not much available for Height. As we're approaching six minutes gone here in the second quarter, and right now, the flow of this game and the tempo belongs to the visitors from Conway, South Carolina. Well, give offensive coordinator Dave Pantanaud quite a bit of credit for mixing up what he's done on film and coming in and having a different game plan in this first round playoff game. There is movement. There is a penalty flag. Akeem Knight was coming across to try to gobble up the quarterback. Offsides, number 93 of the defense, unabated to the quarterback. The five-yard penalty, second down. And Knight will come out of the game as the five yards moves the sticks closer to a first down. And the shot of clears who are very good in the red zone right now are back in that spot again. In the season, 86% conversion. That's third best in the Big South. That's a solid number. Second and short. Marcus White there next to the quarterback. Gets the call. He's got blockers. Gets inside the 10, gets a first down. And the shot of clears offense. It averages 433 yards per game is on the move. Well, you got Mo Ashley out there getting a block. You see Pat Williams trying to get a block. On the outside, you even see DeMario Bennett, and he kind of got roughed up a little bit. But a good job that time, I believe, by Bethune-Cookman, particularly Rashad Payne coming up and supporting to stop that play. It is first and goal from the six. Right there straight ahead, gets popped inside the five-yard line, got three on the play. This takeaway defense has taken the ball away 34 times this year. Best of the country could use one right here. Total defense, fifth best in the FCS. Scoring defense, top 10. Pass defense, top 10. Best in FBS or FTS in takeaways. Delaware looks to the end zone, throws to the end zone. It is oh, touchdown. Second score of the game for Coastal Carolina, which expands the score to 13-0. Matt Hazel on the receiving end for the TD. Well, one of the things we talked about going into the game, you see a pretty good attempt that time by Tim Burke, who's only 5'10". But if you're going against first-team All-Big South receiver Matt Hazel at 6'3", you better be ready to go up even higher because he'll take it out of the sky. And he's a, what I call a mountain climber. Six foot four, must look about seven foot four out there to some of those smaller corners. Now it's Katrin for his second extra point of the game. And after a scoreless first quarter, the shot of clears for the Big South are taking over. Aramis Hiller with a toss for his 18th reception and score of the year.
Before commercial break, Matt Hazel, six touchdown reception of the season, has bumped the lead to 14 for Coastal Carolina, making its third playoff appearance. Bethune Cookman, last appearance 2010, eliminated in the second round by New Hampshire. And again, the MIAC has not won a playoff game since 1999, and this is a tough assignment today against one of the two teams from the Big South to make the playoffs in Coastal Carolina. Yeah, when you think about Coastal Carolina, Jim, and, and Stony Brook, those two teams in the same conference, what a game those two teams had. And so I think when you look at that, both of those teams in the playoffs said something about this conference. Coastal Carolina and Liberty and Stony Brook tying for the Big South regular season championship at 5-1. While Bethune couldn't win perfect in the MIAC at 8 0. Need to get a good run back and good field position, but this football won't even get to the 20. Last time we saw the Chanticleers on defense, Andre Jacobs, the backup linebacker with over 200 career tackles, put a hit on the quarterback. And he's number 40 coming off the edge right here. And somewhat of a delayed blitz right there because he actually was in coverage and kind of a dog late. And I think when you look at what he did there, the close, that short area burst, it shows why he's been a factor at this school and has such great career numbers. Any potential for him to play on Sundays and Monday nights? Well, I think he can on special teams. Will he get into camp? That remains to be seen. I should mention Sundays, Monday nights, Thursdays, whatever days the National Football League plays on. Almost every day of the week. <laughs> well, you know what? They're going to add Tuesdays soon here. Terrific Tuesdays. They'll find another thing. Yes, they will. <laughs> it's Isidore Jackson trying to make something happen, and he picks up 10 on this first down carry. Big Cookman back to the running game, and Quentin Williams carries there. 247 yards per game for the Wildcats, rushing the ball. 27 touchdowns. And this is arguably what the Wildcats do best. So two rushes on this series of downs, good for 15 yards. Here's Jackson, negotiates his way through, picks up another first down. It's a good thing to see the Wildcats with the running game in mm -hmm. effect here because that is their calling card. And that was somewhat of a slant play. They run behind Rashard Brown, who's a good run blocker, and they get some positive yardage in that fashion. Isidore Jackson now over a thousand yards rushing for his splendid career. Hey, line, 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 line. And with over a thousand yards this season, he also has a 92 yard rush for touchdown. It's an amazing story that I'm sure we'll get a chance to update with you on from time to time. And a very inspirational story back. Bake to the running back, throw to the flat. Most of Carolina spotted it. Ball is going to be marked down by the line judge at the 47. I'm not so sure that wasn't a fumble right there. We'll see. I thought Johnny Houston, let's take a look and see if he gets this out. Yeah, I thought it was coming out before the knee. So, I, I yeah. mean, they, they go back, Jordan Murphy. He got rocked right there, and Murphy's, they're going to take a look at it. I think that was a good hit by Houston, um, and I thought right away when I saw it that that was a fumble. The ruling on the previous play that the runner was down before the ball came loose. That play is under further review. So for the first time today, to the replay booth we go. Now Brian Jenkins is going to plead here, but I think it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Yeah, well, he gets the hat on the ball, and that knee never hit the ground and ended up being on the back. I think of Houston as he comes up. You see it, watch, watch his right knee. It never hits the ground. The ball's already out before that right elbow hits down. And, and Murphy's a good football player. You know, he's, they use him on some wham blocks. They use him in a lot, number of different facets. There's another look at it. You see that right, or left knee, excuse me, never hits the ground. And it was an excellent play. And I'm gonna give somebody else credit on that play. Uh, Quentin Davis, who, who was running to the football and didn't stop. So many times you see stuff like that, Jim, and players stop and assume if nobody recovers it, there wouldn't be a review right yes. now. <laughs> yeah, you're taught to keep going, are you not? You better, especially if it's the first round FCS playoff. Game. Yes, sir. There's a national championship out there for somebody. 20 teams available for this series of games that will conclude in December. 
winner of this game, plenty at stake, heads to second round activity next week in Norfolk, Virginia, to take on a very good team in Old Dominion. Well, I'll tell you what, you go face them, you better be ready to cover somebody. Oh, yes. A chance to watch them against Norfolk State in the battle last year of Norfolk, Virginia. First round, first time those teams had ever gotten together, and particularly for a game of significance in the playoffs. And Old Dominion dominated. Well, tell me a little bit about Taylor. What, what did you see? The, 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 their outstanding quarterback who, who just had another phenomenal year. After further review, when the ball came out before the runner was down, therefore it is Coastal Carolina's ball. They immediately recovered the ball. The first and 10, Coastal Carolina. Well, I'm guessing if Brian Jenkins is arguing that the play was stopped. Well, now that would be a legitimate argument. And now, but the, when you say stop, was the whistle blown? So if we had a chance to maybe hear if the whistle was blown. Let's listen in. Legitimate argument. Yes, sir. Legitimate argument by, by head coach Brian Jenkins. And that's an excellent job by him. And, and if, 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 if there was a way he could challenge it now so they would listen to the sound, clearly the referees did not get that call right from. They got the call right in the booth, the replay. But, boy, you heard it. Because the whistle then makes it a dead play, right? Exactly. exactly. So, therefore, there would not be a turnover, correct? Well, I mean, I guess it comes down to the whistle blows, the play stops at that point. So you can't put it under review at that point. And I think that's what your point is, and also Brian Jenkins. At that point, it's an incomplete pass. Well, if everybody had kept running on the play, yeah. that would have been a loose football. Mm -hmm. Coastal Carolina would have picked it up and probably advanced it. And that's why the coaches always tell you, defensive coaches always say, run to the football and Clayton Carlin right now has to be happy that Quentin Davis did just that across the middle and Hiller on a quick hitter has the football inside the 20-yard line Thomas Basilio number five who was the uh, backup tight end on the receiving and he gets shaken up David Duran not able to go today he is injured Let's see how number five was affected on this play and what happened. Well, if number basically, he, he was in man coverage. When you talk about Nestle Marcellon had him in man coverage, he thought he was blocking. So all of a sudden, he releases, and Marcellon blitzes. He's wide open. Oh, so Pasiello with a reception, a first down inside the 20 at Coastal Carolina. And a chance to really put some distance between itself and Bethune Cookman. Well, if you're watching Brian Jenkins and you have moments to go, he's not going to let this go. Game clock for 25 seconds. There's no foul for delay of game. The play clock is not reset. But more importantly, right now, his defense has to play under composure and try to force at the very worst a field goal attempt well that's what they need and, and I think you've got to identify where Hazel is at and don't forget about Bennett because even in some of their bigger games earlier in the year he's made plays as well another big receiver at the exposition over here on the right side quarterback from the gun is Aramis Hillary got plenty of time to throw they release backs on both sides and they've got a reception going Jeremy Hyde with a catch he could have thrown to either side of the field there, Corey. He had some open receivers. Yeah, and they're doing a good job of, of, of mixing in what they're doing. They're attacking over the middle. You've seen them go to the flats. You've seen the zone read misdirection. You've seen the option. You've seen them throw the jump phase. They've done a lot offensively to keep the throne cooking off balance. Chance here for the shot to clears to go up by three scores after a scoreless first quarter. It's a quarterback draw for Hillary. Wagner, as we showed you earlier, a significant lead in its game on Colgate, and that has gone final now 31 20. Wagner on to the second round. 
You were headed to Montana next week, is that right? Yeah, I'm going to get a chance to watch uh, Montana State, and, and I'm looking forward. We talked about it, Denarius McGee, uh, even without Elvis Ackler getting it done up there in Montana. Can't wait to get up that way. Villanova and the other Big South representative, Stony Brook. Winner of that game to be in the locale next week. Let's take a look at some of the bracketing that's going on. We mentioned Wagner's win, and that's either... That'll be a matchup with Eastern Washington next week. Villanova and Stony Brook underway today to face Montana State. And on the right side of the bracket, the higher seeds, number three, Montana State, and the aforementioned number two, Eastern Washington. It's a little colder in Montana, by the way. You probably know that already. <laughs> Nothing is as cold, Jim, as Minnesota. I live there. So you can give me the coldest place in the country, we'll be okay. And Green Bay was pretty cold too. Yes, I will say this, some, uh, some very good snow games in the past in Montana <laughs> on this level. South Dakota State and Eastern Illinois about set the kick. That winner goes to the Fargo Dome next week to face a very good North Dakota State team, the defending champion. New Hampshire and Wofford next week as well. Central Arkansas and always good Georgia Southern. And again, ODU. Awaits the winner of this one. And right now, the dominance belongs to Coastal Carolina. Over center for the first time today. Third and three. Off the edge, the blitz, and that is ineffective. To Wood Lane, laid down the wood. And did Bethune Cookman need a big time play? There. Well, I mean, he's coming off the edge right here completely unblocked. And height didn't even have any chance because they would come off the play action. And look at the close right there. And when you're on block, you have a chance to finish. You have to do exactly what he did. Get him to the ground. We'd like to see him try to cause a fumble right there. He's made enough plays this year. But that was a possibility. Alex Katrin, who's 8 for 10 in kicking field goals from 35 yards. 17-0 in favor of Coastal Carolina, but a minor victory. For defensive coordinator Charlie Yogi Jones and Bethune Cookman taking Coastal Carolina out of touchdown territory and forcing him to go for three. And Hillary took a pop there. I'd say so. I'd say a minor victory that he got up because if any time you have a blind shot like that, and if you're in that situation and your lane, you're trying to really make sure that your lane has no more access. And so when you lay the wood down, like you mentioned, you like to be able to get the ball out, uh, but luckily he was able to get up. 17 second quarter points for Coastal Carolina as we have a short break in this game. What does Bethune Cookman need to do to reverse the fortune? Well, I think one thing they have to do that we haven't seen so far, we talked about him earlier. Are you in Eddie Pool? Where has he been? I, I like to see them try to get him involved because they've thrown the ball some. Um, and then also, we you know Isidore Jackson, obviously he'll get his touches. Uh, but the other player, too, that I think can have or be more of a factor for them offensively uh, is K.J. Stroud. If they can get those two guys on the outside, give them some touches and give them some confidence going, and let's test or they need to test what they have on the outside with Hawthorne and Johnson, the corners from Coastal Carolina. Quarterback Quentin Williams of Bethune Cookman had some open receivers on the first two possessions, but it didn't result in points. <laughs> Courtney Keith returning. Keith misses a tackle. Breaks another one. There's a penalty flag on the play and a good kickoff return to the 38. But typically, more often than not, that's against the return team. Yeah, that looks like it. No doubt. During the return, illegal block in the back. Number eight of the return team. Half the distance to the goal. First down. Early against David Blackwell. And that cost Bethune Cookman some pretty good field position. Well, would have been at its own 38. They're going to mark this back to the eight yard line. The longest current winning streaks in FCS play. Wagner with the best at nine consecutive games. Bethune Cookman's seven in a row, certainly in jeopardy at this point. Shot to clears, come in winners of five straight. And much work to do for number 14, Quentin Williams, as this football is spotted 
deep in Bethune-Cookman territory. And that penalty is a difference of about 30 yards. Still enough time here in the first half to mount a drive. Three timeouts remaining. Cookman, little hitch, fires down the field. He's got a receiver. It's caught. Well, you mentioned Eddie Poole moments ago, and guess what? He just dialed him up for a big-time play. And what they did, they attacked Dontavious Johnson over here on this left side with a double move. You see the pump fake right there. He's running to hit a, really a curl and go. A lot of separation behind him. Even though he's big, he can run. That play good for 59 yards. And oh, did Bethune Cookman need that as Isidore Jackson is met at the line of scrimmage. And he is brought down. Marcus Crowder, among others, number 99 up there. And Roderick Holder, who plays with a lot of fire, 69 up there as well. Those, those guys on defense in front, those guys you just mentioned, they played really well here in the first half. Prior to that long pass reception, just 84 total yards for Bethune Cookman, which averages 385. Isidore Jackson. Is hit at the 35 and is able to carry the football with the clock running to the 33. I didn't think he made a good decision right there. I thought he hesitated before he bounced it outside. I think if he had just hit it up inside right away, I think Jackson had a lane there. And, and, and right there, uh, he could have done a better job to me if he was trusting his instinct. Third and six. Blitz, Williams in trouble, big trouble. Ball loose, Bethune Cuckman recovers it way back in its own territory at the 45 yard line. That's a loss of 23. Mm. We've been talking about Johnny Houston all day in coverage. Well, guess what? He says, if I can't get it down the back end, I'll blitz. Did a good job with his timing, finishing that play. And, and really, Roger Holder, another guy you alluded to, has just had a fantastic first half. Looks like Coastal Carolina will use a timeout here. That's the second timeout for the shot that clears, who will get the football back and will still have a little less than a minute in which to operate with. Set down the sidelines, and here's Angela. All right, guys, so Isidore Jackson, uh, really an emotional story about a young man who has overcome so much. He's a, a guy that lost his parents within just a few years of each other, and Coach um, Brian Jenkins said, you know, it's just amazing what he's overcome. And he said every weekend he would drive home to visit his mother, and then drive back to school. He said that kind of commitment is like no other he's ever seen. And the rage that he plays with, he said he runs for more than a purpose beyond the football field. Jim. It's a great story, Angela. And Brian Jenkins also shared with us, Corey, the fact that uh, there was a moment where coach and player came together face to face because he wanted to be able to get out of Jackson, whatever was bothering him. Of course, the loss of his parents was certainly significant and I think at that moment was able to release and cry and get support from his players that was uh, monumental it was and I think when you, anytime you have a player and I think Angela said it best you lose your mom and you and, and you have to deal with that while you're in school I, I don't know I think it's really tough to come back from get out of, get out of. Shot the clears, let that one go. Out of bounds at the 26, and with 51 seconds to go and a 17-point lead, actually 53 seconds left, football belongs to Coastal Carolina, and the Big South has dominated here in this second quarter. And to me, if it, and if you, you you talk about, we've talked so much about what they've done in their execution. Uh, right here, you've got options. Maybe you just down it and go on in and accept what you've done so far in the first half. Or you say, guess what? We're going to attack again. <laughs> so a lot of options here for the chance to clear. Should get a pretty good idea on first down exactly what they plan to do with the ball here. And the 
put it on the ground and they'll go to a safety play. The challenge for Bethune Cookman the second half is just to get to 17 points after this very good offense has been shut out in the first half. And their defense has played pretty good, Bethune Cookman. They've lived up to the building for the most part. I just think Coastal Carolina's offensive line has played well. And I think they've had some plays that players make those significant plays you have to make to win a playoff game. Final play, first half. It was nothing, nothing after one, and then the shot to clear is busted loose. 17 second quarter points, and that is the difference in our game. And Coastal Carolina will get the football to start the second half as well. To the break we go from Daytona Beach. Welcome back to Daytona. It's halftime, and Coach, we talked about stopping the run. You guys were effective. How do you feel you did on disguising your pressures? I thought we did a pretty good job of that, Angela. Uh, I thought we were a little bit late on, and I think that helped us. I think we disguised some of our coverages. I think that helped us. When we wanted to come with pressure, I thought that was effective. So, so far, I thought we did a pretty good job in the first half. Hillary, 12 completions to seven different receivers. How do you continue that momentum in the second half? Well, what we try to do is we're going to adapt and adjust to what the defense gives us. So the fact that it's seven different receivers doesn't necessarily surprise us. If they give us a little something, we're going to try to take advantage of that. All right, Coach, thank you. Stay tuned. More halftime activity coming up after the break. Always entertaining Bethune Cookman marching band here at halftime in beautiful Daytona Beach, Florida. Temperatures near 70 degrees, plenty of sunshine, and of course, as expected, no rain. Jim Barber and Corey Chavis from Vanderbilt here at the break. 17-0 all coastal Carolina. Let's review the first half and what stands out the most. Well, I think when you look at what they've done defensively, and I'm referring to Coastal Carolina, the pressure package has gotten home a couple of times. You saw it late in that first half that stopped the drive. You've also seen that defense do a good job, to me, of timing up some late add-on pressures. You saw that with the Jacob sack. Uh, so it's been a big deal to me overall in that first half. Let's revisit the keys. Show our audience how smart you were in uh, uh, the first half. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> Well, you look at right here, the link, and we talked about Hazel's link coming into the game against those. That was Burke who made a good attempt to try to go up and stop it. And then we, we're moving it over right here. You see off the edge, getting low on Quentin Williams. Here's another one of the pressure packages. Isidore tries to pick up my man Johnny Houston, but, and he ends up making the sack. So, again, Jacobs, we pointed him out a late add-on right here. Looks like he might have even been in some type of man coverage, but he added on late and, and made the big play. So all of those guys, to me, have had an impact in an area of Miss Hillary. Aramis Hillary in the first half, 12 of 16, 101 yards, a touchdown, and he has spread out the ball nicely. He really has. Uh, I think he's done a good job of throwing the ball to the flats, to his running backs. Uh, he's throwing the ball also to across the middle to Master Mateo uh, and, and, and then on the outside in the red zone. So a little bit of it all from Hillary. Brian Jenkins in the locker room right now for Bethune Cookman. What is his message and what changes must be made? Well, the big change is we don't want to get away from our game plan. All year long, they've really exposed teams in the third quarter, Jim. And this is the biggest third quarter, not only of the season, but maybe in the history of this program because this is a game-changing, to me, quarter for Bethune Cookman. Wildcats for the season have allowed just 20 points in the third quarter, and we'll see shortly if, in fact, the third quarter turns out to be significant. The winner of our game heads to Norfolk, Virginia next week to take on Old Dominion on Saturday, December 1st at 2 o'clock Eastern. Third quarter action to commence momentarily on ESPN3. College football today, round one, FCS championship.
and didn't get wet. You're the team that walked through hell and didn't break a sweat. You're the team. You're the team that paved the way. You're the team. You're the team that's here to play today. You're the team. Go out there with no fear and no doubt. Be ready to show them what it's all about. Because we're here to do it as a family. 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 It's the greatest thing God ever made. Next to himself. Family. 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 Brian Jenkins with Thune Cookman, coach prior to the game. He is live right now with our Angela Mellon on the sidelines. Coach, pregame, you talk no fear, no doubt. What was your message to your team being down by 17? Don't let go of the rope. We've been here before, and we all know what we got to do and how to do it. And that's our plan. Come out, play our brand of football, and get this thing done. Speaking of brand of football, what do you have to do to find your momentum offensively in the second half? Number one thing, if you look at it, we overthrew three touchdowns in the first in the first quarter alone, okay? And then our quarterback made some 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 bad decisions there. We just got to settle him down and run our offense. All right, coach, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, and you mentioned Angela, the quarterback. That's number 14 for Bethune Cookham and Quentin Williams, who in the first half was just 5 of 13 for 86 yards. The rushing game, though, has been stomped. 21 carries, Corey, and just 36 yards. Well, it looks like Rodney Scott has been the most effective when it comes to on the ground uh, and that powerful style he has. Uh, maybe something they look back and go into. But Isidore has to get going. I thought he had some questionable decisions at times uh, on a couple of draw concepts that they had uh, and when the holes were there. And Eugene Solomon, to me, in the middle, is a good enough football player that you can do something in terms of your inside running attack at some point here in the second half. He's 56. He's the center for Bethune-Cookman. Let's get back to Angela for a first-half injury update. That's right, Jim. Coastal Carolina's Thomas Vasilio. He was the tight end that caught the pass down here to set up the field goal for Coastal Carolina. He's out with an ankle injury. So they will put in number 14, Craig Wilk. Expect Coastal to go with a two-back system now they have a young tight end in. Yeah, and to follow that up, that means they have now lost two people at that position this year. And as a result, the two-back attack more than likely effective here in the second half and status quo and why not with a 17-point lead, Corey, and the ball to start the third quarter. Well, you know what? One thing I will say, though, uh, when, when it, it, and you and Angela talked about him leaving the game and then Durant was also somebody that was a big fan. I actually thought Durant had a chance to maybe play at the next level. So, uh, you know, he's a sixth-year guy, and they've used some two tight end personnel when those two guys play together. So to completely scrap that out of your offensive attack now is going to put pressure on their offensive coordinator, Dave Pantanal, in terms of continuing to be creative as he was in the first half. That's Joe Moglia. His first year as head coach of the Shot to Clears has been a huge success. And how about his discussion and word to his players at the first half break? Well, the one thing that they're going to have to do is they're going to have to stay sound defensively in terms of not letting people get behind you. All of a sudden, you see Johnson at the end of the first half. Can't forget about that double move. They may come back to that. Uh, so the corners have to be very disciplined here in terms of their technique. That's Thomas Basilio in your pictures moments ago. Again, the shot to clears. Get the football to start the second half. Finn Hurd has set the kick off. He is six feet, 230 pounds. It's returnable from the goal line. And a pretty good return at that. Trey Henderson past the 25 yard line, and Aramis Hillary. Good first half for the quarterback spot. Set to go back to work. I thought Henderson was going to go ahead and try to see him talking a little bit as he's walking off the field. I thought he was going to go ahead and try to hit the corner right there, Jim. He had a shot there and tried to cut back and almost scored on the return against Appalachian State. He got ran down by the kicker. Yeah. <laughs> Never want that to happen, do you? No matter how good the return is. <laughs> Hillary, first down, with time, and now flushed out. And throw in, receiver comes back to the ball, ball caught past the 40-yard line. 
Demario Bennett his first catch of the game. Thirty-eighth reception, by the way, of the year for the junior out of Douglas, Georgia. That was a gain of 15. Had a scoreless first quarter. Brian Jenkins told Angela on the sidelines to start the second half. But look, we we missed three touchdowns. Our quarterback made some uh, incorrect decisions. Otherwise, we'd be on uh, the scoreboard. So, do you still feel that down by three scores, there's a chance? Oh yeah, I definitely think there's a chance because he's right. We talked about it early in the first quarter. Some of those plays in which he was inaccurate down the field. To the running game, back to back rushes after a first down completion. 24 is Jeremy Height. And in the first half, Height with eight carries for 30 yards. He shot the clears, carried the ball 20 times in that first half for 111 yards. And their average again is 200 a game. So they're right on track. This is third and five. Hazel, reception. Inside the 35-yard line, first down. Shot of clears. Good morning, man. Some double quick slants over there. He gets inside right there of Burke and, and really gets right up the field. And Hazel's a legitimate talent. They have to spread it around here. If not, he could possibly be a 1,000-yard type receiver. He already has a touchdown reception in this game for Coastal Carolina. At the 33, to the edge, dangerous pass ball caught. And a reception of three, but the defender was right in the territory of Niccolo Master Mateo. It was a difficult toss, could have been disastrous. It was a good job by Rashad Payne. Look at him right there getting up and having some length. He's done a good job against blanks all day coming up and, and forcing in those situations. He's off the field now, so somebody else is going to have to get in there and produce like that. This defense has 19 interceptions on the year. Has recovered 15 fumbles, but has forced no turnovers today. Mario Bennett, second catch on the drive. Short of the sticks, but a manageable third down coming up. I think that might be the biggest statistic of significance. No takeaways for Bethune Cookman, which again is their specialty. But well, this is not a quarterback, as you mentioned in the open, that makes a lot of mistakes. Aramis Hillary carrying and looking for that first down. Hillary has combined for some 2,700 yards this year, principally most of them by way of the pass. They signal first down. And the senior quarterback has won a very efficient offense in the first half. His best game earlier this year at the Glass Bowl in Toledo, which he was 30 for 47 and threw for 356 yards and three scores. You see Drew Herring is shaken up. Chad Hamilton, it was a game time decision. One of the tackle spots with his knee wasn't giving it a go at the start of the game. And now this potential loss. I think I think this is huge because I, I already was a little bit when you alerted me to that earlier about Hamilton, who I thought was one of their better with their best exterior offensive linemen. Now to lose Herring and put some pressure on your depth. Kenny Fitzgerald is the backup right tackle. Logan's LaRue, the backup left tackle. So the tackle spot a little lean today for Coastal Carolina. Press set of downs inside the 25. That is loose. And Mathieu Cookman gets his first takeaway of the game. That's Nick Addison on the spot. They run the zone. He likes to run it up inside. You see Danzler come in. But it really pretty much was a bad exchange that time. Hillary pulls it out and it goes off the left hip of height. And then Johnny on the spot, Addison, who made a play earlier to stop a touchdown, now comes back and, and really is just a player that is always, like we talked about, running to the football. Does it as well as anybody. That's the 35th takeaway this year for Bethune Cookman, which is back on offense. Isidore Jackson. 
They swarm to him as you saw three defenders trying to track down number two. He's over a thousand yards on the season that was accomplished in the first half. Duke Cook with 35 takeaways, better than any football championship subdivision team or bowl subdivision team. Jackson tripped up. Well, let's correct that Kent State got some takeaways yesterday, so they're now even at 35, but still to have more takeaways than Alabama, Notre Dame, the rest of the SEC, which is noted for its strong defense. There's no sour milk, I'll tell you that. No, sir. Kent State, which won its 10th in a row yesterday, headed to the MAC championship against defending champion Northern Illinois. It'll be at Ford Field on the ESPN Networks next Friday night. Bethune Cookman got a good turnover to start the second half. Any turnover at this point is, is strong. Now they must convert into points. Cats based here in Daytona Beach, Florida. And ball going one way, receiver Eddie Poole going the other. He had held that ball. He might have had a step that time on Ladarius Hawthorne. They weren't on the same page. He thought Poole would run the hitch route, so he threw it early. Poole was running a nine route or, or a go. One thing that I'm noticing that you have to always know about Coastal Carolina. Sometimes they have the middle of the field at post area exposed. Let's see if Bethune Cookman tries to attack there here in the second half. Right now face the Wildcats are with a third and six. Going to make something happen after the turnover, the first of the game for Coastal Carolina. Williams with time, now in trouble, he'll run. Should get the first down and does, Quentin Williams. Past the 45-yard line, he needed to get to the 43. Plenty enough to keep the drive alive. I think it was a pretty good job by them in protection right there. Uh, Got to be careful over there if you're Alex Monroe. Almost had a close to getting a holding call, but good mobility by William. Monroe played at First Coast High School in Jacksonville, Florida. Now Terrence Hackney, number 69, is on the ground for Bethune-Cookman, but he's able to get up. Hackney, big kid, 6'6", 310, from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Good football player. New season, all MEAC first-teamer. Rodney Scott gets the call. Wildcats not getting away from their running game, which is their bread and butter, as the phrase goes. But that running game shut down under two yards of carry in the first half. And you see Jamel Davis, who's made some plays. Mike McClure at that time. We called his name a couple times in the first half. A lot of players getting in on the act for the Santa Clears. This is third and seven. Under nine minutes for the third quarter. Williams looking for the first down. Blitz on the edge. And he gets clobbered. Never saw Ladarius Hawthorne coming. And another look. And what they're doing right now is they're running a corner cat. And really what opens that up. Anytime you're running something like that, you see the running back has to make a decision. And I really think he did a good job of finishing. Give Quentin Williams some credit. This is a tough kid. Uh, but Dar Ladarius Hawthorne did an excellent job of timing that corner cap. Hawthorne missed a significant amount of games in 2010, seven total. Since then, he has not missed a game at all. He's played 22 straight. And the 5'9 junior with a real pop on the quarterback. Forcing the third game on the offense. The five yard penalty, fourth down. Not only to give up the ball, but not suffer a five yard penalty. And how do you get a delay a game on fourth down when you know you got to give up the ball? Well, it's not like you're trying to do a better job of maybe placing the ball because you're already back here at, you know, on the other side of the 50. But boy, I mean, some of the things that they're doing right now in terms of defensive coordinator Clayton Portland, uh, you got to give Coastal Carolina some credit. Mastro Mateo 
back to receive and he hauls it in at the 25 yard line. Halfway through the third quarter, Coastal Carolina 17, the Boone cook but nothing when we return back to live action. Coastal Carolina 17, Bethune Cookman nothing. Angela Mallon on the sidelines. Let's talk defense, Angela. And this is typically the Wildcats' quarter, is it not? That's right, Jim. As you know, it's no secret they do need to create some momentum offensively. But it is the second half defensive stat that's key here all year long in the third quarter. Only 20 points has Bethune Cookman given up in the last six games. Only two touchdowns. So this is a big quarter for them. Very telling and could very much so uh, tell us about the outcome, Jim. Yeah, and the 35th takeaway just moments ago, Angela, we thought could result in some points for Bethune Cookman for the offense, but not get it going. And so continues to be a shutout for Coastal Carolina, which now is back on offense. And rushing the football up to the sticks and beyond for first down is number 24, Jeremy Height. What about his play so far today, Corey? Solid. I think a workman-like effort. One thing you've seen from him is he's just taking what the defense has given him. He hasn't lost too much yardage because there has been pretty good run defense up front by Bethune. From the 36-yard line, Shadows creeping into the field as we are past 4 o'clock Eastern time in Florida. Another solid gain and a huge one. First down for Height past the midfield marker inside the 45 of Jeremy Height. And this offensive line with just one senior, Pat Williams, starting to bust some holes open. Well, right away, you got to give credit to Mo Ashley, that right guard who was able to come down and and make a good block and then you see Kenny Fitzgerald the sophomore getting up on the second level as well and making a nice block Tim Burke might have saved a touchdown from his right corner spot right again and first down and carrying for five you wonder as good as those numbers off of Bethune mm -hmm. the third quarter defensively mm -hmm. is this defense starting to wear down a bit well I think the one thing that happens is this is a team that has faced active defenses like they, they have before. Maybe not to the proficiency level, but similar. The winner gets Old Dominion next week in Norfolk, Virginia on Saturday afternoon. This is first round NCAA FCS action. And another run to the sticks. To Wood Lane, able to make the tackle, but not before Jeremy Height, who's chewing up some large pieces of yardage. He's able to rush the football to the 33, and they are feeding him a lot here in the third quarter. And they have all the answers. That last time they tried to bring a five-man pressure, they ran away from it. So it seems like every time they try to come up with something to stop him on first down, it hasn't worked on this drive. Back to the run game, Whitener is already has a touchdown. Skipping past the chains and another first down. And a double dose of height and Whitener, 24 and 34. Drop the line for 172 yards on the game. By the way, in the third quarter alone, height, six carries for 57 yards. And Joe Mowgli, his team, is in a pretty good spot right now. They're controlling the line of scrimmage. And they're doing it without their two offensive tackles. Yes. Which says a lot about the production that they have inside. And earlier in the game, you talked about Pat Williams and those starts. And anytime the center on your offensive line is the stalwart, it can help you overcome injuries. That's 75 Mo Ashley right there at 6'4 and 320 pounds, a sophomore. Williams gets away from pressure. Another first down toss. Mario Bennett's third catch of the game, and it's first and goal to go for the shot to clears. Again, what you're getting right there is a spread out, and look at the block by Marcus White right on the edge to set that up, kind of a dash pass, and, and Bennett was effective on that play again. I'm able to get to Hillary, too, to force some sacks. That's a tackle for loss there on first and goal to go. Lavaris Dantzler turns 21. 
She turned 21 in September. And originally signed with Morgan State. So have to make the tackle. He's had a good day. I think he's been very active all afternoon. And, and that's good because they need him here for the rest of this game to continue with that torrid play. As you saw by the graphics, South Dakota is perfect in the red zone today. Three for three, a couple of touchdowns and a field goal. And we have a stoppage in play. Let's see what Joe Moglia and the South Declares dial up. On. In the FCS championship playoffs, here are the breakdown of teams by conference. Big Sky, Colonial Athletic, the Missouri Valley, and the SoCon all got three apiece. The Big South for the first time gets a couple, and the MEAC's lone representative we're watching here today in Bethune Cookman. Miak has not won a playoff game since 1999. It is matched up with a formidable opponent today in the Chanticleers, who have second and goal to go. Back to work here after the Coastal Carolina timeout. What's coming in movement? And before Hillary can do anything with the football, flags all over the place. Michael Roche is our referee today. Offsides, number 99 of the defense with contact. Half the distance to the goal, second down. Offsides there against Bethune Cookman in 99. Harold Love the third. South Dakota State, in very cold weather today, plus seven, wind chill is ahead. Stony Brook has a two touchdown advantage on Villanova. The game has reached the second quarter, and as we told you earlier, Wagner moving out of the second round, beating Colgate 31 to 20. Here it is 17 nothing close to Carolina after the penalty. It is second and goal to go from the three. And somehow, Wildcats. To prevent Coastal Carolina from scoring a touchdown here. And we started the game with clock issues and we'd come back. And they have, you see down there on the field, Harold Love, the third. These guys had to step up. He and, and also Tevin Tony on that offensive line. Big goal line stop against Florida and m last week. They need it here again. Jeremy Hyde is behind the quarterback. It was Aramis Hillary on second and goal. Bill Cookman watching Hillary run the option. He was stopped at the two yard line. Number 50, Brandon Richardson. He played nine games with Central Florida back a year ago. It is third and goal. Good play here for the Bethune Cookman defense. And it's able to put a stop to 24 Jeremy Height. And that brings up fourth and goal. So the defense doing its job at the point of attack. And it all starts with love the third. And the coaches have to love that effort because when you think about Fields coming off the edge, Addison made a key stop on that drive. I'm surprised that Tony, he's inside making some plays. They're really stepping up now, and it looks like Coastal Carolina's not just settling for a field goal. They're going for it on fourth down. They're just looking for the knockout punch in this game. Hillary on fourth down, rolling out of the pocket, shooting to the end zone, picked off. Nick Addison forces the second turnover of the game and, and saves the moment for Bethune Cookman. This telecast is copyrighted by the NCAA for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this telecast or any picture, descriptions, or accounts of the game without the NCAA's consent is prohibited. Among other things, Nick Addison, the free safety for Bethune Cookman, was a high school quarterback. He knows how to read quarterbacks, and today he has been all over the field. It's been a very effective one for him, has it not? Well, I love a good safety play. And you see him right there coming up and tackling. Only 180, 185 pounds, but he'll stick his nose in there. And one of the things you've seen is right there, 
getting the ball out on contact. Again, around the ball, the fumble recovery. And in the end zone, you're going to test our corners. I'll be there to have their backs. Thune Cookman now the leader in the football championship series with the 36 takeaway. But the bigger question is, can this offense convert those takeaways into points? So far to the answer to that, no. But they have the football again. Wildcats at their own 20. And Broderick Waters in the game for the first time at the quarterback spot for Bethune Cookman. We know Quentin Williams took a pretty good pop the last time off a corner blitz. So now it's an opportunity for Broderick Waters, transfer from Louisiana Tech, to try to bring the Wildcats back. Show you the hit moments ago, something like Quentin Williams. And he never had a chance to see the blind side, did he? Well, he didn't because Isidore Jackson did a good job picking up Mike McGlure. It's a combination corner cat. He has to take the inside shoulder of Jackson, and that opened it up for Hawthorne off the edge. Don't know if uh, Williams' departure is injury related or the fact that Brian Jenkins just wanted to make a change. Third and short, they'll go option looking for the first down. And they get it, Isidore Jackson with a pitch moments ago from Roderick Waters. And the drive, albeit a short one so far, continues. He needs to run with more fire. They, they, they're going to make a legitimate push here uh, going into this fourth quarter. He has to run with more violence. I think he stuttered his feet a little too much at various points today. Think he's tentative, in other words? I, I, I've seen that from him at times. First down, 33. Quarterback keep. It's a good one. Waters is loose. Inside 30, 20, 15, and dragged down at the 10 yard line. And what a huge play for the backup quarterback, Roderick Waters. Well, that change turns out to be a significant one, doesn't it? Well, he's a better runner than Williams. You've seen that any time he's gotten in games this year, he's not going to beat you with his arm. But even at Louisiana Tech, that wild dog formation, he's a factor with the ball in his hand. On the 10-yard line. Points needed badly by Bethune Cookman. 1.30 to go in the third quarter. Now Waters has over 500 yards rushing this year. Came into the game averaging over seven yards a carry. Second and goal. Ball spotted at the six. So they can still pick up a first down at the one yard line, so it is not a goal to goal situation. Quarterback keep. And dragged down by Quinn Backus. Big play as Broderick Waters tried to get to the, to the edge. Touchdown here reduces the game to a two score affair and with no points so far. Obviously, this drive is a monster. Yeah, and I think you have to score a touchdown to get even the fans a little bit more in belief mode. Wildcats need four yards for the first down and five yards for a touchdown. 30 seconds to go, third quarter. Little screen pass. And then that's blown up in a hurry. Rodney Scott with a catch, and he was going nowhere. Play over there by Dan Tavis Jackson Johnson, excuse me. He's had a good day tackling. So Ben Cook will have a decision to make when we come back to start the fourth quarter, but they need touchdowns to have a chance. After three, it is 17 0 Coastal Carolina. Roderick Waters has ignited a Wildcats late in the third quarter, but can he get some points out of it? 56 yards moments ago and has run close to the end zone.
This is our line score after three quarters. Coastal Carolina with all the game's points in the second quarter. And Aramis Hillary, 17 of 22, 158 yards, and a touchdown and one pick as the quarterback for the Chanticleers. Bethune Cookman has two takeaways. One is possibly going to result in points here, and a decision to be made. You go for six or settle for three. And it looks like an attempted field goal is coming up. It's been heard on the year is just six of 13. This is a very makeable one for 23 yards out for the first points of the game for the Wildcats. There's movement everywhere. But Bill Cookman thinks that that will be on Coastal Carolina. Kind of hard to knock LeVon McCoy down her backwards at 380 pounds, but that's what happened on that one. Well, they needed four yards for the first down. Big call here. Ball start on the offense. It's a five-yard penalty. Fourth down. Instead, it's attached to the offense. That field goal now would be attempted from 28 yards out. That's Brian Jenkins, the head coach. Here's what's happened moments ago. You know, it looks like they're actually trying to get set in position, and that's what the false start was called. They're going to call it on the entire offensive line if that's what they're calling. I think his argument is that that's what they do in terms of getting into their position to three-point stance, and that's what forced Coastal Carolina to jump. So a little bit of a... I guess controversial call right there, but uh, not going to get that one back. I guarantee you that. Early in the first half, Jenkins was upset at a blown whistle on a play that eventually went up to replay, and replay official Buddy Ward, we got an explanation at the break that replay was able to overrule because there was a catch and a fumble that was called on the field. Jenkins was infuriated with that call, which resulted in a turnover on the Wildcats. And now this, five yards further back, which means the attempt would be 28 yards away. In the meantime, Michael Roach is communicating with his officiating team. Wait for the call here. Is that heard is only one out of five from 30 to 39 yards. So you're on the brink of that range where yes. He is a little bit inconsistent, so what do you do regardless of what ultimately becomes the call? Ball's pushed back to the 11. They would need 10 yards to continue the drive as the first down marker is at the 1. Jenkins continues his tirade. And, uh, they got a flat. Unsportsmanlike conduct from Bethune Cookman sideline. It'll be a 15 yard penalty. Fourth down. That's a killer, and that can't happen. That's inexcusable. At this point in the game, uh, it can't become about, it can't become about really, in this case, the coach. And, and unfortunately, that's kind of what we're seeing right here. And this is the second time something like this has occurred. It happened a couple weeks back, and we talked with Coach about that. And that passion and emotion. That makes him so successful harboring on the line a little bit here. And I, and I think that's something he'll have to watch. And he's still not done drawing with the officials as we speak. You know, Jenkins was sharing with us last night that he typically doesn't sweep, sleep during a football week. And he's probably not going to sleep much after this. Well, I mean, you've put your team in this position. You've put them back, you know, fourth and forever. And now you're going to need somebody to bail you out, one of those teams, one of your players on this team. Got to get to the one-yard line for a first down. Waters looking and still looking and still dancing. Going to shoot one in the end zone. Caught. Touchdown. Oh, my, what a big play. Stroud bails out the coach. Bails him out. They've gotten the keys. We're out of jail. Get free card and look at him smiling right there. And, and I tell you, almost a smile from coach. 
but not quite. I tell you what, anytime you have a player that goes up and makes a play like that at this time in the game, it to me could change the momentum of this football game. Oh, yes. And, and Stroud to get that foot down even more remarkable. By the way, that play is under review, so we'll be going up to Buddy Ward, the replay official technician, Josh Pritzker. Here's what they'll see when they review. It's one foot to be in the end zone in bounds and control the ball as well. What do you think, partner? I think he gets it down. I think he gets that right foot down before his... Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I take that back. I take that back. The left elbow came down out of bounds before the right foot. Let's see. Ah, that's close. I say with a call on the field saying touchdown and it being that close, that is no way that I think it gets overturned in that situation. I think it says something. Well, it, it takes what they call IVE, irreversible <laughs> video evidence. Right. To overturn the play. And if you're a Bethune Cookman fan, you hope for the sake of your coach that the play stands. Well, yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, we, we talked about, and I'm sure coaches, he's a little upset with himself that maybe he put his team in that position. Kind of be happy that his players would come back and show that kind of effort for him on that play. You can see it was almost like, we talked about it, kind of like a jailbreak play a little bit, and you got out free, but the bottom line is, can you get this call to go your way and build on the momentum? The way it looks to me, that left hand is down before the right foot. Or simultaneous, again, which would mean... Well, in baseball, they say tie goes to the runner. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what the... For Bethune Cookman's sake, hopefully that's a call that continues to stand as what it was called on the field. Just a super play by K.J. Stroud. Let's not forget the effort by quarterback Roderick Waters. Right. Who had enough composure to get out of the pocket, look for a receiver. He knew he had to pitch it to the end zone or to the one-yard line, which is right next to the end zone. Well, it gets frustrating, even for Coach uh, Jenkins down the field. Some of these players, they're used to having success. It's been a while since they lost the game. So anytime you get into these situations, and now you finally experience that success again, if that play stands, I think they have a chance maybe to build on that here. Plenty of time left, the beginning of the fourth quarter. And if it doesn't stand, Coastal Carolina gets the football. And points taken off the board. It's funny how this whole thing works. So a couple of minutes back, we were looking at him on a field goal. Now, all of a sudden, we're saying whether or not they got a touchdown yes. from back at the 25 to 30 yard line. So, complete reversal of fortune, uh, and it could end up working out for Bethune. Here's Michael Roach for the biggest call of the game. After further review, the ruling on the field is reversed. The receiver caught the ball in the air and his hand touched the white boundary in the back end of the end zone. Therefore, the pass is incomplete. It'll be Coastal Carolina's ball at the previous spot, first and ten. And Brian Jenkins is being held back. Well, the very fiery, passionate coach who does not sleep around this time of year, particularly as we get to football Saturdays, has had a rough second half. Well, I mean, me and you both talked about it. It was possibly simultaneous. We felt like because it looked like a tie, that maybe it would go. But to me, initially, I thought maybe that hand got down a little bit before the right foot. But right now, if you've been doing Cookman, forget about it. You have to move on to the next play. And as a coach, you have to get forget about that play and make sure your team is ready to come out and get a defensive stop. Well, Angel Mellon mentioned that Bethune Cookman's quarter defensively was the third and did not allow any points. We have just started the fourth quarter, although it seems like we've been here for about a half hour over the last couple of minutes. Right. But the introduction of instant replay has brought a lot to the game, and most importantly, it has brought accuracy. And I think most people watching this game probably guessed the left hand went down before the one foot was in. It also brought some accountability to the referees in terms of performance. Yes, sir. 
Goes to Carolina with the ball, second and nine. And a three score lead. Run defense up to the line of scrimmage and able to meet the running back for no gain. A little chippiness going on. <laughs> Whoever came up with that word, I think there's something a little bit more <laughs> macho than that, but you right. get the idea. I mean, when you talk about aggressiveness, it's a chip off the old block if you're Coastal Carolina up front. And, and Kevin Hart, he's going to mix it up with you. Not the biggest player inside, 260 pounds, but he's a sophomore that's trying to graduate onto that upperclassman level with a good performance that he's doing it here today. Shot to clears right at their average on third down for this game, four of eight. And protecting a 17-point lead. And before anything happens, we have a whistle. Delay of game on the offense. It's a five-yard penalty, third down. I, I don't get that. <laughs> I don't get how you could have a delay of game right now, unless there was something with the clock where you didn't see it. I don't know. Uh, but to put yourself now in a third and 14 Correction. and give up the ball right Before back. Before the delay of game call, timeout number 66 for Coastal Carolina. Wow. That is the second timeout pass. Ryan Jenkins will call over his defense. And with 13-12 to go, Coastal Carolina gets bailed out of what would have been a five-yard penalty and a much longer third down opportunity. Can't be surprised at who called that timeout either, huh? Pat Williams. Yep. He is the lone senior and the anchor of that offense. First round activity going on today in Brookings, South Dakota, Eastern Illinois, and South Dakota State. That winner goes to the Fargo Dome to face the defending champion Bison. Hampshire and Watford already underway, as is Central Arkansas, excuse me, next week. Hampshire and Watford and Central Arkansas, Georgia Southern, and Old Dominion. It's the winner of this game, and right now Coastal Carolina is in a pretty good spot. Well, they are. I, I, we're interested to see what happens with that South Dakota State game. We've been talking a little bit about that weather. Uh, they have one of the fastest players in the country, Zach Zinner. And I don't think any weather is going to slow him down. Uh, and I think the last time we checked, they had that lead in the game. Good football for the Jackrabbits. Very good women's basketball program there as well. It is third and eight. Blitz off the edge. They set up the screen. Not enough for the first down. So Bethune Cookman to get the ball back. Hazel with a catch. He already has a touchdown reception. And a pretty strong defensive play by DJ Howard, whose dad played at Bethune Cookman. I like the way Howard and also Dancer, Tavares Dancer, have played. They've done a good job today of being active and getting outside. And sometimes when you have a lot of uh, peripheral things going on in the game, you forget about some of those outstanding efforts. You don't want to leave out with those two guys who've done their own defense today for the throw. Howard's a local high school product. Football at the 40-yard line. There's still time for Bethune Cookman, but oh, does it uh, need points? 12:24 left in this football game. Jim Barber, Corey Chavis, early in the fourth quarter. Let's go down to Angela Mellon, who's going to talk about Brian Jenkins, who's been the topic of conversation here in the fourth quarter. <laughs> He certainly has, Jim, and after that 15-yard penalty, then the overturned touchdown, one of his assistants slipped him a candy bar. What you guys may not know is that they have to monitor Coach Jenkins eating because he nearly doesn't eat. We've already talked several times about how he doesn't sleep. My guess is the blood sugar had gotten low and he needed a little juice. The question will be, will his team have enough juice to finish this game out, Jim? Yeah, it certainly could use some. He typically fasts on... Uh on the Friday prior to game day, typically up until about 9 o'clock, and gets back to the team hotel, bite to eat, brings the family in for a couple hours, and it's back to watching game film. And that's probably not atypical of coaches, but he really feels that he owes the university a lot for this opportunity. And his personality is such that uh, he won't let things rest. And typically won't let himself rest a whole lot either. Good 
Cookman shut out to this point, averaging over 30 points a game with the football and still time. At home, they're averaging close to five touchdowns per game. But today they have run into a pretty tough defense. Still, it's a first down inside Coastal Carolina territory. Backup quarterback is Broderick Waters, keeping and carrying for the first down, and a pick up of 12 to the 35. Let's talk about number 11 and what he has done since coming off the bench late third quarter for him. Well, I man, I think he's made quick decisions, Jim, and the one thing you like about him is that he's decisive once he hits the edge. He's got good speed. He also has some hip flexibility. First and 10, Isidore Jackson is number two, and they have shut him down for the most part in this game. I'm just not sure, though, with a, you know, 10.58 to go in the game, that you can continue to run this style of attack and not involve pool on the outside and also Stroud. You already saw Stroud's athleticism on that near touchdown. Keep those guys involved and don't forget about them because, to me, at this point, you have to involve them in the game. Well, Waters threw that touchdown that was reversed moments ago. He's going to throw right now. And it's picked off. And that's going to be run back. That could be a pick six. Johnny Houston, touchdown, and likely to seal the deal for Coastal Carolina. You mentioned earlier, Houston had been around all the big plays, it seemed, for most of the afternoon, and now he gets one. Well, the one thing about Houston, you can go back to the Appalachian State game, another pick on the sideline. So he's not a guy that has had, not only is his second pick of the season, but when you start going towards the sidelines, he has a, a feel for defending along the chalk. And you saw that right there. He timed his curl flat break, and he made a pick. Shot to clear is now up 23. And we'll send a number of people to the exit. Alex Catron out for the extra points. He has knocked out three in a row. And his pick six moments ago by number 26, Johnny Houston, big. To go number nine, Tavares Dantzler picked up a 15-yard penalty after the made extra point. That will be assessed on the kickoff. Been a rough fourth quarter for Bethune-Cookman, which had a chance and a makeable field goal by Sven Hurd. The penalty of five yards led to Brian Jenkins erupting. He thought it should have been five against Coastal Carolina. So on fourth and forever, touchdown pass to K.J. Stroud was reversed. Stroud had the elbow down outside of the end zone and then an opportunity still trying to come back Johnny Houston of Coastal Carolina runs one back 68 yards for a score had a 15 yard penalty to that and Bethune Cookman and its wheels have come off here in the fourth quarter a little bit disappointing uh, I think when you think about what they've done this year and how well they've played and what a job he's done as a coach I mean 27 and 7 in his career coming into this game second time he's hosted a playoff game here at this stadium I think he felt like it would be a little bit different today, and so far it hasn't gone that way uh, for Bethune Cookman. But I, I think this fourth quarter, it's not over yet. Somebody has to make a play. And credit his coaching staff and people on the sidelines of trying to help him keep his composure here. As you mentioned, it's been a terrific year, nine and two, perfect in the MEAC at eight and zero. Oh, it's the first time ever that's happened for Bethune Cookman. And so you have to take it all to the great considerations here and all the wonderful things that have happened, even though this one's not going the right way. The 2012 NCAA Division I Football Championship will continue next weekend with second-round games on December 1st, and all games will be seen on ESPN3. For more information, go to NCAA.com. 
the official online home for all 89 NCAA championships. Corey Chavis will be headed second round activity in Montana. I'm looking forward to that. I, I, by the way, I was just telling some of my friends, I, I hunt wild boar. Okay. I'm not sure if I'm ready for the elk yet. Is that, that's the area of the country I'm going to. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> I'm sure your friends will assist you in any way possible. <laughs> Football at the 25. Quentin Williams started the game at quarterback, then Roderick Waters came in, threw the pick six moments ago, had thrown what looked to be a touchdown pass to K.J. Stroud, at least that was the ruling on the field, and as you know by now, that play was reversed by replay. A couple of guys come out, have come out of nowhere today to me. Roderick Holder and also Dominic Whiteside have good days on that Chanticleer's defensive line. By the way, you're mentioning deer and elk season. Um, in Montana, the cutoff, we understand, is November 25th. Well, I just made it then, right? Well, you're going to be going December 1st or oh, thereabouts, so man. sorry about that. I thought you said I was leaving early. Well, you could. <laughs> <laughs> Might be on your dime, but. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. It's always on my dime, man. I always have to play. Third and nine. Two representatives from the Big South. Coastal Carolina is one of them, and it's been a success so far. First round of the FCS championship playoffs. Waters to throw, and is this, no, incomplete. Nearly a pick. <laughs> 25, Ladarius Hawthorne thought he had it, and he did have it. Good break right there on the out route. It was an out route that was run. He got out of the break. He rounded a little bit and raised up, and then he found his, I have to say, found his body control and got underneath it. And really did a good job of closing to the upfield shoulder. Almost had him a pick six, potentially, if he had gotten out cleaner on that break. Hawthorne was ruled out of bounds, so no catch, no interception. Still the shot of clears. will get the ball back and have a 24-0 lead. Football at the 44-yard line. Let's visit the FCS Championship Series. Top five seeds, North Dakota State, defending champions. They'll host next week, second round at the Fargo Dome. Eastern Washington, Montana State, Old Dominion, and Georgia Southern, typically all heavyweights. Yeah, definitely. And North Dakota State, you talk about defense. We've seen some good defense out here today from a team in Coastal Carolina that's been pretty solid in that facet. Nobody does it better than North Dakota State, number one in the nation in total defense. Playing at a real tough venue for visiting teams next week, the Fargo Dome, which seats over 17,000, and it can rock. No need for the Chanticleers to put the ball in the air now with a 24-0 lead. A chance to share the ball and share the wealth as Jamel Davis carries there. <laughs> Take that Travis Small. What a difference having a senior quarterback makes, uh, Jim. I mean, I think we've seen it today. That one quarterback, his first playoff action. Hillary, a little bit more experienced this season, and, and you've seen that throughout the game. Hillary, top 25 in pass efficiency and total offense coming in, and those numbers likely to get much better. As Small carries again. And I call, right now, Coastal Carolina is just bleeding some clock. Yeah, they are. And then you, you want to see uh, what, what you're getting, though, from Bethune Cookman's defensive line. Right there, you had Tevin Tony still showing that maximum effort. You know, we've mentioned Anthony Woodard's name earlier, Harold Love the third. They're not in the game right now because you see they're spreading them out a little bit here on third down. Probably still going to run it, though. A four receiver set to the, the far side and too close to this sideline. Not enough for the first down, so Bethune Cookman will get the ball back. And 
We are at the eight minute mark of our football game. Scoreless first quarter, 17 second quarter points for Coastal Carolina and then a touchdown on an interception return here in the fourth. Austin think, Kane back to punt. I think that's what we, what we saw right there. Most coaches in that situation would run the ball, but when you have a senior, you know he won't make that critical error. You go ahead and allow him to really put your punter in a better position right here. Take time to visit the MEAC news and notes. Plenty of them. As we approach the playoffs, first round series. Award winners, the Eddie Robinson Award to finalists, the Brian Jenkins from Bethune Cookman. You're watching Brian today. The Offensive Player of the Year is Nick Elko from Delaware State. Keith Poe of Howard, the Defensive Player of the Year. Howard was second best in the MEAC this year to Bethune Cookman. And congratulations to Brian Jenkins being one of the finalists. We also have a finalist on the other side for National Coach of the Year. And you're watching to Joe Moglia and his team with a four score lead. Brian Williams has returned as the quarterback for Bethune Cookman. It's a pretty interesting names you had on that list. Um, our crew downstairs doing a good job of letting us kind of reacclimate with some of those players. I think Keith Poe has a chance to get drafted in the NFL draft next next spring. So there's some good players in this conference. And, and, and Williams now getting a chance to kind of make up for some earlier wrongs in this game. He played a number of years in the National Football League, three separate teams. I think you probably know talent as well as anybody. Got a receiver down the field, and this may go for a touchdown. David Blackwell, big time play. Williams to Blackwell and Bethune Cookman on the scoreboard. And now with a touchdown, down 18, you need to go for two to, ride, to try to reduce this to a two score game. Well, the argument today will be when you take Williams out, you lose that passing element. That's his 11th touchdown of the year. Blackwell's a big play player. Can't forget a couple years back. He was running all over the place as a quarterback for this team. So Williams now, if he can get a score right here on this two-pointer, it's a two-score game again. Yes, sir. And all of a sudden, everything changes. Blackwell, his third touchdown reception of the year with 6.44 to go. Williams has time. Coastal Carolina drops many in coverage, but... Pass caught, two-point conversion by K.J. Stroud. It's now 24-8 and a two-score game. Well, just as they thought that Bethune-Cookman was dead. To the rescue, David Blackwell. A wide receiver from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. two Eddie Robinson coaching award finalists in our game. Here's the other one, Joe Mobley of Coastal Carolina. Defensive player of the year, Quinn Backus from Coastal Carolina and the FCS playoffs have two teams in postseason for the first time ever from the Big South. Coastal Carolina and Stony Brook. It's been a good year for Joe's team, which at one point of the season was struggling mightily, but has not lost in a while. Oftentimes when you play other teams that are maybe even at a higher level than you at that time during the season, whether that be in Appalachian State or whomever it may be, it gives you a little bit better barometer of what you need to improve on. And I think that's what you've seen from this football team. But they better wake up right now because this game is not over, and this is going to be a key play in terms of this kickoff. Let's see if it's an onside kick. In fact, it is. It's got to go 10. Coastal Carolina falls on the football in Bethune-Cookman territory and will protect the possession. Although typically the ball can change hands a few times. 
Well, Johnny Houston was down there with sure hands on number 26. He's like the late, great Whitney, and he's singing all the right tunes today. <laughs> Sven Hurd with the kickoff. And Johnny Houston, who is that 68-yard return for touchdown on an interception, able to gobble it up and keep the possession for the shot to clear. It's a five-yard penalty ended to the end of the return. First down, Coastal Carolina. And there was offsides charged on that play as well. They don't re-kick it. That would be unfair to the team trying to protect the possession. And so instead, Coastal Carolina keeps the football, gets an additional five yards. Johnny Houston came to play today. That was a big onside recovery. It's not that big of a deal now because they got the ball back, but if they don't get it and he doesn't recover it, all of a sudden now you're talking about their one score away from making it a one score game. The winner to face Old Dominion next week, round two on ESPN three of the FCS playoffs. And it's a steady diet of runs right now for the Shauna Clears, and why not? This has been a specialty for them this season. And clock control right now is the mode of attack as we dip under six and a half minutes of the game. You know, I know one thing that's going to be on their minds this week are getting those tackles back healthy. Regardless of whether or not they advance or not, they need to get those guys back healthy to give themselves the best chance to compete with Old Dominion next week. Speaking of Chad Hamilton, he was a question mark for today's game because of a knee injury suffered last week with Drew Herring, who was shaken up in this game. Well, right now it's a strip, scoop, and score mentality for Bethune Cookman. That's all the defense can do at this point. And on the other side, Coastal Carolina wraps itself around the ball. When, when they're in four-minute mode, you work on this during practice. You have your two-minute drills. And a lot of people don't realize we also have the four-minute drills if you're at the collegiate or professional level. And what then is, you're trying to protect the football, grind out yardage, get first downs, those things you talked about already, Jim. But more than anything else, you have a plan during this time. You, as a coach, you have a certain plays that you like to go to, and we're seeing that on this drive. And every second of the play clock being used right now by quarterback Aramis Hillary. Not even significant at this point to pick up first downs, although that allows them to continue to keep possession. But just use that play clock down to its last ticks before actually implementing a play. And you have to kind of manage it on the other side as to when do you begin to use your timeouts to try to get the football back, particularly in this case when you're down by 16 instead of 14 or even 7. So a lot of decisions on both sidelines here, coaching decisions from here on out. There are two timeouts remaining for the Wildcats. But a helpless position for this defense and more... Importantly for the Bethune Cookman offense, it's running by 16. And just some very simple dive plays right now. As Travis Small carries the football again. Sonic Clares are in field goal position, but would you risk something like that on fourth down with the potential of a team that blocks a lot of kicks? No, 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 not at all. Not with Dawood Lane out there and what he's been able to do. Uh, the last couple of weeks. Three straight games, I think he's blocked the kick, so I'm not kicking in at all. I was a little bit worried. I, I didn't know if you're on the Coastal Carolina sideline. When they scored, where was he at? But uh, definitely right now, I agree with what you would do, and that just continue to run it. 364 total yards in the game for the shot of clears on third and five. Straight up the middle is small. Brought down the 20, brings up fourth down. Approach three and a half minutes for the football game. Most of Carolina needs just a couple of yards to continue to drive, but right now will elect a field goal try. Well, one thing we know, 
Joe Mobley uh, knows a lot more about the numbers game than me. <laughs> so let's see what, it, what his odds are right here. I felt like maybe not, but when they make this, essentially the game's over. Bill Cookman has blocked 10 kicks this year. And before a 37-yard attempt has been made. I'm out. Coastal Carolina. That's their final timeout of the half. The players will use a timeout. Let's head down to Angela on the sidelines. You know, Jim, it's the inspirational stories of college football that just really make our jobs fun. And Quinn Backus has one. And growing up, he was in four different foster care homes, finally to connect with a cousin that he now calls mom. He says he takes his life in two perspectives. He says his physical attributes, having to overcome being a shorter guy, earning a scholarship, earning playing time, and then his personal life. And what he has had to overcome there are both motivations for how he, you know, approaches life in general and the game of football. It is a good story, Angelo. You know, we think of these coaches as, well, coaches, that's their job first to win. To take a look at his numbers. Big South Defensive Player of the Year, but a lot of times, and Brian Jenkins has shared that, I imagine Joe Mobley as well, that they have to serve as almost a backup father to a number of these guys who haven't uh, had fathers in their lives for a period of time. Yeah, never was that more uh, exemplified than, than looking at this story and looking at what he's had to overcome. But at the end of the day, the way he's playing is sending the message. Natural from 37 yards out. Kick is up, and the kick is no good. Well, it remains a two-score game with 2.55 left, and hope, albeit small, is still available for Bethune-Cookman. What you want to do right now is we talked about something that they haven't done all day, and that's attack the middle of the field, Jim. I believe it's there still. I don't know whether or not they're going to go with any middle of the field closed looks where a safety would be there back deep. But what they've had is a lot of split open looks, which means you have two deep defenders back. But what you also have is that middle of the field exposed. So let's see if they change that up. Another look at the attempted field goal. Oh, wobbles its way for the right end. Ruled no good. 2.55 to go. Quentin Williams, who found David Blackwell before from 78 yards out, looking for a receiver. And wisely gets out of bounds to stop the clock at the 27-yard line. They still have two timeouts remaining, the Wildcats do, but have to make up 16 points. And would this be a miracle finish if that was to happen? Well, it would be. One of the things that, that Coastal has done, they've made a little bit of an adjustment. and They're not going to employ the same coverages that they had before. In fact, they're actually using one player, Pernell Williams, back deep. He's normally down as the whip. He's back deep now as well as McCarthy. Rushing four, Williams in trouble against that four-man rush. And throwing, and it is picked off, but it is picked off out of bounds. Now Quinn Backus. He was in the top 10 for tackles in the NCAA prior today and has done himself no dishonor or disservice with his play this afternoon. Looked like a defensive back on that play. Yes, he did. <laughs> had a game recently in which he had 16 tackles, forced a fumble, got a pick. Third and three. Inside handoff, good enough for the first down. Big clock at the 35-yard line by Tom Davis Johnson. And Isidore Jackson said, I didn't feel that. But we heard it. Did you do that at Vanderbilt? I did not. I mean, you talk about the Jacksons, man. He's part of Jackson 5 with that song. 35-yard line, Williams looking down the field, man, coverage, it's Poole with a reception. Eddie Poole, number three, hauls it in at the 24-yard line, and Hope Springs a turtle for the Wildcats. You know what, I just, you know, we talked about this kid all day. I don't know, I'm sorry, I don't know why they don't throw the ball up more. His ability to high point balls down the field, we've seen it, so we're not surprised. Eight touchdowns back. This was a game you needed him in. You think about the touchdown that had been reversed, which at this point could have had Bethune-Cookman in a one-score game instead of two. 
Williams out of the pocket. Lots of times, got a receiver. It's the running back, Jackson. He gets down to the 10-yard line. Luke Cookman rushing up to the line of scrimmage. Couple of substitutions. Need to go quickly. Still have two timeouts left. 135 for the game. Williams, handoff Jackson. 10 yard line, five. Jackson, touchdown. And now for Bethune Cookman, a try for a two point conversion. Things are looking a little bit different now, aren't they? Yeah. It's an interesting call, too. Well, I mean, I mean we, we talked about Mr. Solomon inside. He made a good block. Jackson made a good cut. And, and, and there's a different vibe right now on that Bethune-Cookman sidelines. I believe it took them a while. Now they're starting to really believe, you know what? I think we can we come back in time. This two-point conversion, it all really comes down to this. Try to reduce the score and the deficit to eight. Williams from the shotgun. Looks to the end zone, now rolls, looking for Jackson. Running with the football, throwing, and it is knocked down. Two-point try, no good. And it remains a two-score game with 1.20 to go, but a hearty effort by Bethune Cookman here in the fourth. Yeah, I'm, I'm impressed. It, it says a lot about Coach Jenkins. Well, it almost looked like Williams was going to run for it, but they had contain on him. That wouldn't have happened. Yeah, they did, and, and, and I think I know McCarthy probably wants that. Wouldn't have counted on your stats, though, Tyler, even though it was a good play. But I do think that they've shown that party effort you talked about, Jim. It's just a couple of things that I would have liked to have seen maybe occur in terms of what you saw in that drive. The pool, pool has made some plays today, but how many opportunities? Not a lot. Won't be a good taste in Brian Jenkins' mouth when this one ends. And, and just the same, the fact is they're able to get a couple scores in the fourth quarter, take some sting out of what was a situation to start the fourth quarter when it looked like the uh, Cookman and its coach were out of control. He revisited the fourth quarter with a penalty from around the six-yard line. Led to the eruption by the coach, a 15-yard penalty. Led to a long touchdown throw that was reversed. And so, the score 17-0. Oh. Then Waters was picked off, and it was 24-0. And people headed to the sidelines and to the end zone and to the cars. And after that, two touchdowns, a, a near two-point conversion there that would have reduced the lead to a one-score game. Good effort here late by the Wildcats. Well, one thing that's going to be questioned, aside from the whole pool thing I was talking about, is Broderick Waters came in the game, had some success on the ground, but then when you start having Broderick Waters throw the football, you're talking about a 49% passer, so it's not like he's coming into the game as efficient as you have with Quentin Williams. And since he's been back in the game, Williams, the passing efficiency is totally changed for Bethune Cookman. So he'll that'll be one question mark at the end of this game. He's been heard number 39 to try another onside kick. Last time Johnny Houston recovered for Coastal Carolina. My ball fielded by Hazel and Coastal Carolina gets the football. Bill Cookman can stop the clock two more times with two timeouts remaining. Well, I'll say one thing. This has been a most entertaining and unusual fourth quarter that I've seen in football all season long. Yeah, we got treated to some eye-opening things here. Uh, also, some eye-opening plays. Saw some players make plays that we felt like they could make earlier come through late. And we saw the tenacity and the love that this Bethune-Cookman team has for Coach Jenkins because they fight for him all the way down to the end. They do indeed. But Coastal Carolina is headed to the second round to play Old Dominion. As the Big South, the two representatives about to get a winner here. And the MEAC's frustration continues, dating back to 1999, but again with this fourth quarter showing has gained some respect, I think, here down the stretch. 
Yeah, they, I'd like to see this conference break through, though. Which means you got to win a playoff game, right? Exactly. <laughs> Uh, and I mean, when I, you know, you asked, I believe you asked uh, Coach about that last night. I thought it was a great question, too, because you know, ultimately, does it not mean anything that the MEAC, that you're representing the MEAC, does, it, does winning that conference now not mean anything? So I, I thought the question that you had was, was on time because it, it, it kind of sums up where you're at as a program. And so when you win the game, you're winning it not only for your conference, but it's saying something about you winning your conference. And, and so, uh, yes, I totally agree with you. Somebody from this conference has to break through and win a playoff game again. As we look ahead to the second round for Coastal Carolina, what's Old Dominion's biggest concerns when facing this team? Well, I think the one thing they can do is they can get you off balance offensively. I, I talked about uh, the, the offensive coordinator, Dave Pettinog. I thought he did a good job with his game plan. He switched it up a little bit. He kind of goes with what you're doing defensively. Now, Old Dominion can score, but I think that they also have proven at times this year they can give up a lot of points, too. So for an explosive offense like the shot to clearance have, you have to be able to me to be prepared for a couple of different things. And Aramis Hillary doing a nice job of protecting the football and running the offense today at the quarterback spot with a shot to clears. Right now, keep the ball on the ground. Whitener was already carried for a touchdown. Little carry for a first down there. Back to Conway, South Carolina by way of playing when this game is over for Coastal Carolina. And for Bethune Cookman, the season will end at 9 and 3. Shots are clear. Started the season winning two, then lost four, and that'll make it now six consecutive victories. If I'm coaching a football team, I'd rather it be the other way, like what you just said. I'd rather lose those games, maybe a little four in a row, whatever it was, and then get hot late, like both of these teams were going into the playoffs. to score more than 24 points next week if you're going to be the Monarchs, though. Uh, I mean, it's not like that. You're, you're playing a quarterback in Taylor Heineke who's 68%, 4,139 yards or whatever it is. That offense averages 538 yards a game. Uh, 35 touchdown passes to only 13 interceptions. Big challenge next week uh, for Coastal Carolina. Agreed. Congratulations to Joe Mowgli and the Coastal Carolina Chanticleers who come on the road today to advance to the second round of the NCAA FCS championship for the first time ever. So for Corey Chavis, I'm Jim Barber. So long from Daytona Beach, Florida. Final score, Coastal Carolina. 24, Bethune Cookman, 14. To watch this entire game on replay as well as other games on our family of ESPN networks, log on to watch ESPN.com.